Good evening. My name is Anthony De Gregorio. I am the president of Pre Soma at Virginia Tech. The purpose of the Pre Student Osteopathic Medical Association is to promote and inform the public about osteopathic medical education, to increase the number of applicants in the osteopathic medical school, and to prepare our members for entrance into college, colleges of osteopathic medicine. Now, we also want you all to be prepared for life after college as a doctor. And to do that, we have a special guest lecturer today. He is someone who is from a small town on the bank of the Mississippi, who grew up to be one of the nation's most elite physicians. I'm proud to announce Pre Soma's first lecture, My Life in Medicine, with Dr. Robinson. Well, thanks a bunch. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here tonight. And, and despite the fact that I've been practicing clinically for over 30 years now, it really doesn't seem like that long ago that I was sitting at uh, University of Missouri uh, in Columbia, Missouri, you know, in your shoes. So, uh, so it, life really does uh, move uh, quickly and a lot of times more quickly than you'd like it to, but, uh, but it, does, uh, it does move uh, quickly for you. Uh, I'm also reminded of my small town roots anytime I'm on a big campus, uh, just like for example tonight, I'm thinking, all right, so I get over here, I've got a few extra minutes and then I can't get parking and then I'm parked way over and I'm like jogging around uh, uh, to get over here. But, but anyway, uh, we're, uh, I think we're gonna have some fun tonight. Um, again, uh, being a native Missourian, you know, I have my own special set of genetic challenges. You've all heard about the Ozarks, I'm sure. So I love this little saying from Forrest Gump. Uh, so, uh, and I always have to remind myself uh, when I start to talk that it's entirely possible that I, I might, look, might not look uh, highly intelligent. Uh, so uh, with that said, uh, I'll tell you that I really, I got my start in medicine back then. And um, I lived in Louisiana, Missouri. It's a town of 4,000 people, counting cats and dogs. We did not actually have a, uh, uh, a stoplight in the traditional sense that you see a red, yellow, green. We had two stoplights that were just flashing red lights, one at one end of town and one at the other end of town. Um, we were also the county seat, Pike County, Missouri. And so we had the county hospital there. So that was uh, for that little county in Missouri, that was kind of the epicenter of medicine. So we had a small county hospital there. And uh, I think there were about eight doctors there in town. Um, there was a mix of MDs and DOs, I think about six MDs, and then my dad, who's a DO, and his partner. And uh, so that was, that was who did uh, medical care, not just for Louisiana, Missouri, but for a lot of the surrounding area. And that was, uh, when, when you talk about your basic country doctor, uh, that's, what these, uh, that's what these folks were. So this little illustration up here is really how I got started. So my dad had an old World War II Je Willys Jeep. Now, that's not the exact Jeep. I think he actually had a hard top on it. Uh, but that's a, that's a very reasonable uh, depiction of uh, exactly what he made house calls in. You had to have four-wheel drive because you were bumping along these dirt country roads uh, out uh, all over the place. Now, on your right there, that really looks almost exactly like the bag that I used to cut carry for him. And that was kind of my summer job when I was a little guy, you know, like 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. So in the summertime, Wednesday was house call day. And so we'd load up the Jeep in the morning. I'd carry this bag that I thought you could pretty much do open heart surgery out of back then. I was like, wow, it's just an amazing thing. And there was all these medicines and everything in there. And we'd go out and see all the folks that we had to see for house calls. Now, back then in medicine, the barter system was in full control of what was going on. So uh, my dad would you know, do something for somebody and, and he'd just uh, you know, be paid in chickens or eggs, or if you delivered a baby, maybe you got a side of beef. And uh, we had a uh, meat locker that was in Bowling Green, Missouri, and, uh, which is about 10 miles away from Louisiana. So Louisiana's right on the river. If you go 10 miles west, you run into Bowling Green. Bowling Green wasn't actually uh, big enough to have its own high school. There were two towns that were involved in that to have enough folks for one high school. Uh, I had 83 people in my graduating class. Anybody from uh, a graduating class smaller than 83 people. All right, got a few people in here, so you, you know what it's like. So uh, that's how he got paid. And so my mom, a lot of times, would call Bowling Green, call the meat locker, and say, well, let's see, I want so many T-bone steaks, so many pounds of hamburger, a rump roast, and, and then we would 
drive up there, pick everything up from the meat locker, drive back to the house, and then store it uh, in the freezer. So, so that's, that's kind of how things went. And I'll, I'll never forget the gratitude that I saw on people's faces when my dad would come out and, and tend to somebody, whatever their particular problem was, you know, giving them a shot of antibiotics, sewing something up, checking on a, a fracture, uh, all of the things that, uh, that you do as a, as a primary care country doctor. And uh, back then they also, you know, general practitioners or GPs as they were called, also did a lot of what was considered routine surgery. So, uh, they would do, you know, tonsillectomies, uh, they would take out an appendix, uh, they would do gallbladder surgery, they would do C-sections if needed, so, uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, the emergency room was typically staffed by a nurse, and so the nurse would be there, somebody, you know, comes into the emergency room, who's your doctor? Oh, it's Dr. Brolinson. So then the nurse would call home, and then my dad would go out and see the patient. So that was really before, in small rural towns, you were, you were staffed by a physician at night in the emergency room. So whoever the patient came in to see, unless you were on call for that doctor, you went to see your own patients. And uh, so just a, a really kind of, a, kind of an interesting system. And of course, you know, I remember at that time, I thought, wow, that, you know, it's this, this huge big hospital. And, you know, in point of fact, it was probably about a 70 or 80 bed hospital. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a huge place, but to me, it was a big place and it was a very interesting place. And, and so that's really how I kind of got going. Those, uh, those were my uh, training wheels. I also say uh, that uh, I probably had a genetic defect uh, that made me want to be a doctor because we see a picture of my mom when she was young and uh, really an attractive lady <laughs> back then. <laughs> and then here's my dad and I, and this was actually uh, at my, we went to the same medical school, we went to Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he graduated in 1953 and I graduated in 1983. So I'm at my 15th reunion, he's at his 45th uh, reunion there. And uh, he actually practiced actively for just a little over 50 years uh, in rural Missouri. So again, uh, I think that combination uh, was, uh, was one that really uh, made me very much interested in, in math and science. And, um, and again, I think uh, was, was very instrumental in me choosing a career in medicine. That was kind of the good news. The bad news was, is that if your mom's a nurse and your dad's a doctor, what does everybody think you're gonna be? I think you're going to be a nurse or a doctor. You're going to, you know, obviously be going into the medical profession. So for a long time, you know, I really struggled with the idea of, you know, do I want to be a doctor because everybody thinks I ought to be a doctor, or do I really want to be a doctor? And it was a kind of a tough thing for me, especially when I was in college. Add that to the fact that both my grandfathers were engineers. Now, my father uh, immigrated from Sweden. Uh, with his mom and dad, they eventually settled in the New York area, and so my grandfather on that side of the family uh, was a mechanical engineer uh, of some repute, and he went back and forth between Stockholm and New York, and, and again, they eventually settled in New York. My grandfather on my mom's side uh, was also a mechanical engineer of some repute and lived in the, in the uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania uh, area. So I had a mom that's a nurse, a dad that's a doctor, and I got two grandfathers that are engineers. So what that ends up creating is a physician with very neat handwriting. <laughs> because both of my grandfathers were always on me about printing properly and we'd send letters back and forth and they were always commenting on my penmanship and making sure that, that my penmanship was good. But it also, uh, when I started at University of Missouri, I was trying to figure out well, what do I want to do. Well, I kind of liked art a little bit. Obviously, I, I like science and math. And so I was kind of torn between, well, should I be an architect? because that was kind of one of the directions I was really interested in, or should I be a physician? So being a typical freshman, not knowing exactly what to do, I sort of started taking courses marching down both pathways. And I eventually had an epiphany in, a, in, a, in an upper level uh, calculus class. There was about maybe, I don't know, 20 or 25 people in the class. And the professor started going around the room, and I was, this is probably second semester of my sophomore year, and said, well, what's your major? Electrical engineering, well, what's your major? Chemical engineering, what's your major? Civil engineering, uh, what's your major? Uh, organic chemistry, I mean, you were kind of going around the room and finally got to me and they said, what's your major? I said, biology, and everybody went, what's he doing here? <laughs> you know? And uh, so at that point I said, you know what? 
you know, if I'm the only natural science major <laughs> in this class, uh, maybe I need to think uh, about a little bit of a different path. So that was really when I started to think, you know what, I think it's the natural sciences that really interest me and physiology really interests me, although I still really enjoyed physics and calculus and, and those kinds of things, but I, I really started to develop a, a love for for physiology and, and genetics and, and, uh, and biology. So I really started going down uh, that pathway. So that's kind of how I really uh, got going in that direction. Then uh, obviously, um, you know, one of the things that uh, comes up a lot uh, with respect to medicine these days, and I just want to make sure we're where we ought to be, is um, what about this whole osteopathic thing versus the allopathic thing? And you got to remember that when I went to medical school, I think there were 13 osteopathic medical schools in the country. So something like five, five or ten percent of the, well, probably like five percent of the physician workforce in the United States at that time were DOs. Uh, and osteopathic medicine was primarily rural, mostly primary care, and mostly in underserved areas. Now the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine was the first school. Founded by Andrew Taylor Still. Anybody know where Andrew Taylor Still is from? Virginia. See, boy, I tell you what, got to get it pretty early to get past you, huh? So Andrew Taylor Still is a is a native Virginian. So the interesting thing is now with the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine located here uh, in the research park at Virginia Tech, we kind of feel like that osteopathy's come full circle. It's come from Virginia out to Missouri, and now back to Virginia. So I think that's pretty exciting. So Dr. Still was a Civil War surgeon that really became uh, dissatisfied with the practices of his day. And you got to remember that the practice of medicine back then was pretty rudimentary. There was a lot of carpentry involved, a lot of unfortunately, a lot of wound infections, a lot of complications. And so uh, Dr. Still decided that he wanted to start his own medical school and really have a different philosophic approach. So for those of you that have been interested in osteopathy, you know that there are four basic tenets of osteopathic medicine. Body unity, or the body is a unit. That structure and function are interrelated. That the body is a self-healing mechanism if you give it the opportunity to get better. And rational treatment of our fellow man is based on those principles. So that's how osteopathic medicine got started. And initially, it, he, it was a separate pathway because he wanted it to be a separate pathway. And it proceeded like that for quite some time. So you had sort of the allopathic medical system and the osteopathic medical system. We had osteopathic hospitals and allopathic hospitals. Well, eventually that became a little bit too cumbersome. And so you started seeing, yes, it's an allopathic hospital, but there were DOs on staff. Or yes, it's an osteopathic hospital, but there are MDs on staff. And, uh, I don't think you see very much of that, if any of that, anymore, but I can tell you that when I you know, came through my internship and residency, I trained at a place called Toledo, Ohio at Parkview Osteopathic Hospital. Now, I used to always joke a little bit about that because I was like, well, there's more MDs here on staff than are DOs. Why are we calling it osteopathic? But, uh, you know, it traditionally had one of those old traditional osteopathic hospitals. And so uh, that was uh, just kind of the nature of the beast. I think uh, many of you are aware now that uh, there are, I believe, 30 schools of osteopathic medicine, and now one in five students matriculating in medical school in this country are matriculating in osteopathic medical schools. Osteopathic medicine is the fastest growing medical profession right now, and that's something that I think is really exciting for, if, for me personally. My dad is now 94, and actually uh, he's here at Warm Hearth. Unfortunately, we'll, we lost my mom a few years back. Uh, but, um, you know, my dad would be, that'd be something he'd be really proud of and, 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 and it's something that I'm very proud of to see the growth. And I think that the growth is a direct result of these four basic tenets that Andrew Taylor Still laid down uh, over a hundred years ago. Uh, we do have a different approach, a different thought process, and, and we have a different mechanism uh, by which we train people. And I think to use words like holistic or whole person approach. I mean, you hear that a lot, they're buzzwords, but I really believe that that's, that's how we approach patients. We don't look at patients as being a disease process. We look at patients as being people that are being negatively influenced by a disease process. I truly believe that I don't heal anybody, I don't heal anything, 
What I do is I hope to put people in a position to, to be better. And that's using a combination of you know, drugs, therapies, diagnostic tools, and of course the thing that everybody hangs their hat on is manual medicine. So when people ask me about, well, what is the DO anyway? I say probably the easiest thing to think of is if you took an MD and took a chiropractor and kind of jammed them together into one doctor, then you'd have a DO. And, uh, and that's probably the easiest analogy. We use our hands a lot. We use our hands a lot both diagnostically and therapeutically. I practice sports medicine. I'm the head team physician here at Virginia Tech. We use manual medicine a lot. Probably one third to one half of the patients that we see on a daily basis have complaints that are amenable to a structural evaluation and treatment. Because we've been here and doing this for so long, we have patients, you know, student athletes that just walk in and, and the reason they're there is, I need an adjustment. Well, why do you need an adjustment? We've got the conference championship coming up this weekend and I know that I swim faster, I run better, I jump higher, I feel better after I have a treatment. And uh, so again, that's a pretty exciting thing. So athletes have gotten used to manual medicine. I don't see how you could do sports medicine without doing manual medicine. Athletes use it for pain control, oftentimes in the place of using other medications. There are a lot of times that you know, athletes are, in general, pretty careful about what they eat, pretty careful about the medicines they put in their bodies, and so uh, they're, they're very much into natural approaches. So not only do we have you know, a nice uh, group of uh, primary care physicians, that are osteopathic physicians. We have a massage therapist. We have an acupuncturist. Obviously, we have orthopedic surgeons that work with us. One's an MD, the other's a DO. Uh, so again, I, I really can't visualize practicing sports medicine without using manual medicine and practicing family practice without using manual, manual medicine. So I started out uh, in uh, clinical practice in Toledo, Ohio after I completed my training. And I you know, thought that I was going to go into the corner uh, office and go into private practice and that was just going to be you know, my life and I was really, really excited about that. About, uh, oh, I guess about three or four miles from my office was, uh, was Central Catholic High School. And so I had uh, some you know, teachers and administrators from Central Catholic High School that were, became patients pretty quickly. And they very soon asked me, did I want to be a team physician? They needed a new team physician. So I started working with Central Catholic High School in addition to my usual uh, primary care practice. And back then, uh, you know, family physicians generally did OB. So I did OB. Uh, we all followed our own patients in the hospital as opposed to these days, especially in urban environments, you use hospitalists. So it's pretty rare for primary care physicians now to be in the hospital. But back then, we followed all our own patients uh, in the hospital. So I was you know, delivering babies, uh, making rounds in the hospital, taking care of a heart attack, stroke, pneumonia, uh, and also team physician for Central Catholic High School. Now, about two years after I started doing that, uh, I got a call from uh, Toledo Hospital, who worked with a pretty novel name for a hospital in Toledo, Ohio, don't you think? Oh, let's call it Toledo Hospital. Uh, but Toledo Hospital was the big tertiary care hospital there. And I'd done rotations there uh, when I was uh, you know, doing my uh, training. Parkview Hospital was a small, uh, again, osteopathic hospital uh, that was about 140 beds. So Toledo Hospital was the big place and they were affiliated with the uh, University of Toledo and University of Toledo was needing some additional sports medicine uh, coverage. And so they asked me, would I come and start to help out at uh, University of Toledo? And I said, sure. So, so I had Central Catholic High School, I had University of Toledo, I had my primary care practice, and I was doing about 50 deliveries a year, so about one a week, or as the saying goes, I always had one hanging, you know, <laughs> there was always one that was just about ready to go. And I could never get another partner that wanted to do OB. So for the first three years of my practice, I did OB, did, I don't know, 100 and I think 57 deliveries in that neighborhood uh, over that period of time. So you guessed it, so whenever I was in, in town, I was on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because nobody else in my group did OB. I was the only one that did OB. So after doing that, covering Central Catholic High School and taking care of University of Toledo, I was tired. <laughs> and so I said, you know what, I've got to you know, take a good hard look at this and try to you know, see what I can do to maybe make my life a little bit better here. So, talked with our practice manager and I said, so let me, let me look at these OB numbers. And, and so just in, in real rough numbers, kind of what's going on here? How much money do I get for delivery? How, what's our collection ratio? 
uh, how much time do I have to take out of the office because of those deliveries because they always seem to come at night so you're up all night and then maybe you got to cancel a half day of patients you got to move them around so essentially when we looked at how much I paid in malpractice the amount of revenue that I lost out of the office for being you know in the hospital and doing those deliveries uh, practice manager looked at me and she said well Dr. Bronson it's about a break-even deal for you right now. And I said, really? She says, yeah. She goes, when we just look at all the factors here, you're probably not making a whole lot of money doing that. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to have an expensive hobby, it may as well be a Porsche or something like that, rather than beat myself up late at night. So that's, so that's how I, I, I got out of the OB business. But I had something really unusual happen here just in the past uh, few days. So one of the families that I worked with back then uh, uh, who were patients uh, you know, for a long time and eventually uh, they moved away but he was a, a fellow that I worked with, uh, he was a professor in exercise physiology at University of Toledo so we did some research together and they had uh, one set of twin boys and then another boy. Well they, when they moved here to Toledo, Ohio they had the twin boys but I delivered the other boy <coughs> and he just got accepted at the Spartanburg School because now his dad uh, is in Charleston at the College of Charleston so that's that is a really unique experience for me and that's how I know I'm really getting old because uh, you know when you deliver a baby that then is you know starting to matriculate in medical school you know, that, that really gives you a little bit of pause but really exciting uh, to to say that and it was kind of funny when he was in during his interview I'd written a letter for him and they, and they asked him so how long you know Dr. Bronson so he said since birth <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was uh, that was kind of cool so so that's uh, kind of how the first part of my practice life went. And I think and one of my really smart business friends said, you know, careers typically go like in eight to 10 year increments. So, and that's kind of the way of the world these days. It's not like you sort of start something and you just grind it out for 30, 40, 50 years and then you're done. They come, careers come in about eight to 10 year increments. So that first eight to 10 years was, was private practice mostly, uh, doing high school and collegiate uh, sports medicine. As that developed, then Toledo Hospital eventually approached me and said, you know, there are these sports medicine fellowships that are kind of springing up all over the place, and we think maybe we ought to start one of those because they already had a family practice residency training program. They had a vascular fellowship, and uh, so they said, you know, we'd probably like to have a sports medicine fellowship here, and we think maybe you ought to run that for us. So I thought, well, it kind of an interesting concept. I didn't know whether I really wanted to do that or not because I was still having a lot of fun doing family practice. I really enjoyed being in the hospital, practicing acute uh, care medicine and working with my colleagues there. But eventually after some consideration and talking with my group, and at that point, I think I had five in my group, around five or six. Uh, so I elected to go half time in my primary care practice and then half time in running the sports medicine fellowship out of the family practice residency there at Toledo Hospital. And, and so the deal that my group made with me was we were back then what we called an eat what you kill model, which means however many people you see, that's how much you get paid. <laughs> there wasn't a, a lot of day, a lot, a lot of times these days, uh, people go out and they join group practices that are owned by hospitals and so they're, they're salaried. Back then that was uh, pretty much unheard of. So they said, you know, as long as you, you know, understand that, you know, whatever happens with your practice, that, you know, that's what you're going to get paid. And, and importantly, as long as you take all of your own call, because nobody wanted to take any of my call. So as long as I would be on the one in five or one in six rotation, whatever that would be, they were fine with it. And so, so we made that transition. And then I think the next year we added another physician. So I think we got to seven physicians at that point. And uh, so I was rounding on my own patients, seeing my own patients in the, in the office. And at that point, I closed my patient panel. So I wasn't taking any new patients. I was seeing new patients in the sports medicine clinic at the hospital, but not taking any new patients uh, in my office practice. So, uh, so then I went through a period of time where I was also extremely busy. We started out with one fellow. We went to two fellows, and we went to three fellows. We started out with two high schools, and then we eventually went to 18 high schools. We started out with a very small sort of physical therapy, sports medicine area. And eventually, when I left Toledo in 2002, we had a 110,000 square foot facility with uh, an orthopedic sports medicine fellowship, primary care sports medicine fellowship, a medical office building, a big gym, and uh, four ORs attached to it. So that just gives you an indication of how quickly that grew. And I had a, just a tremendous 
uh, experience there in Toledo and, and really enjoyed my time there. And, um, and then I got a call from uh, down here at Virginia Tech uh, from, uh, from Dixie Rollins, who at that time was the dean, and somebody that I'd known from Kirksville. She was uh, about two years ahead of me in school, so she's somebody that I'd known over the years because she'd been involved in sports medicine. She'd run a family practice residency, so I'd run into her at a lot of meetings. And the existing team physician down here was retiring, and so they were looking to transition from their clinical model to an academic model. They wanted somebody who'd you know, run a teaching program, who had done research, who'd been a Division I team physician. And uh, so, long story short, I came down a couple of times and kind of went back and forth and, and considered it. And uh, it, when I got down here, it really made me feel a lot like home. I really felt like I was back in rural Missouri. It's kind of interesting. I'd meet people from Virginia Tech and they'd say, you know, we know you're from that big city of Toledo, Ohio. And we know Blacksburg is kind of small, so if you wanted to live in Roanoke, that'd be okay, and you could just drive back and forth. I said, no. I always joked with people in Toledo that Toledo was the biggest place I could ever live. Now, Toledo is only 350,000 people, but, you know, for a guy that grew up in a town of 4,000 people, who then went to Columbia, Missouri to go to school, which was a town of 60,000 people, and then went to Kirksville, Missouri, to go to medical school, which was a town of 25,000 people. When I got to a town of 350,000 people, I was like, oh my God, look at this traffic, you know? I mean, it was crazy. So I was like, the whole idea for me is to get back to a more rural setting. That's what I grew up with, that's what I'm comfortable with, and so I'm really excited to be uh, coming back to a more rural environment. And despite the fact that I thought we had a really great fellowship training program there in Toledo, I thought, like almost anybody that is developing something, you think, well, you know what, there's some ways I can tweak this and make it better uh, because it's going to be in a more academic environment as opposed to a more clinical environment. So that's how I got down here in 2002 and came down here in 2002 and I think it was in 2004 that we took our first fellow and then we went to two fellows and went to three fellows and now we're at four fellows. And my goal is always, I say, train them and retain them. So just about every fellow I've trained I've tried to retain. So some of them have gone on to other jobs and they've, they've all really had great jobs and, and looking back at the fellows that I trained when I was in Toledo and the fellows that I've trained here, uh, it's I'm around 68 or so, 67, 68 fellows that I've trained over the years and, and they've all really uh, just been fun to work with and it's something that I think uh, really keeps you on your toes when you're involved in academic medicine because every day I have medical students asking me questions, I have residents asking me questions, I have fellows asking me questions and I do a lot of scratching my head going, hmm, what's the answer to that one? And they say, well, well why is that? And, and I can't just say, well, just because, you know, have to have a good reason for that. And so I think that's really been something, being involved in, in medical education, really since the inception of my career, but truly being an academic physician since 2002, has been something that's been very rewarding. It was interesting for me when I delivered my first lecture to first year medical students because I'd been involved at the terminal end of medical education for quite some time. I'd been primarily training fellows and the fellow's job is to train the resident. The resident's job is to train the students. So my interaction with medical students was, was pretty limited. And so I showed up and uh, you know, started uh, teaching and, and it was literally, you know, I'd just see like deer in the headlights. And I, and I thought to myself, you know what? that's probably not the level that we need to be teaching at here. So I had to kind of ratchet that down a little bit and that was a, a, you know, a big learning process for me and, and I think really enhanced my skill set uh, as a medical educator because you really have to teach to the level just like when you're dealing with patients. You've got to deal with the level of patient you see in front of you, not use a lot of you know, medical jargon, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you really need to communicate with patients and with students in a manner that they're comfortable with being communicated with. And that's the only way you can develop a therapeutic relationship with a patient and an educational relationship with those that you're trying to kind of get up to speed. So that's kind of the sort of the brief history of, of how I got involved and how I got to where I am. Now, one of the big things you hear today are, are all the problems. And so I'm going to put a couple of slides up here and talk about the problems uh, in medicine and kind of what's going on these days and, and, uh, and, and what's happening. So in medical education, there are all kinds of challenges that are out there. All kinds of different systems of doing things. Um, 
and, and I think that it's interesting when you look, I've got a couple of clips here, but you'll see one of these comes from JAMA, right? And so those of you in the back, I don't know if you can read that, but that's March the 29th of 1930. <laughs> It's kind of interesting when you review all these things, you know, the same stuff that they were complaining about back in 1930 is about the same stuff that's being complained about today. So again, it's how do we educate? What are the best ways to do this? How do we teach people? You know, so it's, so it's sort of like what's old is new again. And so I think those challenges are always going to be there. One thing that we can say for sure is that I can promise you that the PDR, the physician's desk reference, has gotten a whole lot thicker than when I first went into practice. In fact, nobody really even uses a PDR anymore. I'm one of the few ones that I still actually get that sent to me every year because I just like turning the pages and that's just kind of how, how I do things. But everybody now has you know, some type of a smartphone with an app that's downloaded that they can look all the stuff up in. But, but again, the, the therapeutic armamentarium in terms of the numbers of medicines that are out there that people can use has probably doubled, maybe even tripled over my practice life. So it used to be that you could know most of those things. Now you can't know most of those things. I think that if you looked at physicians that graduated from medical school in the 60s, they could probably know just about everything there was to know about medicine in terms of uh, therapeutics and surgery because there were a limited number of procedures and a limited number of drugs were available. That's impossible. So that's one of the big challenges that we have today in terms of how do we figure out what's the important stuff, how do you deliver it in a way uh, that makes it meaningful and useful and retainable, and how do you prepare somebody for an environment that's evolving very quickly. And we interface now with machines more than ever before. And I always say, you know, you gotta be smarter than the equipment you operate. And it, that's getting to be a tough job for me these days uh, with all of the different electronic interfaces and all the things that are, that are going on. But I think it's also very, very exciting. And I think that uh, one of the things that, that I'm very excited about that you see, not just at VCOM, but at all medical schools, is for lack of a better term, what I'll call experiential medicine. So now we use a lot more uh, real-time patient-based scenarios with high fidelity simulation. So we have very sophisticated dummies, basically, uh, that scenarios can be presented to single medical students or groups of medical students, and you're required to synthesize clinical information and then make therapeutic judgments in a real-time fashion. And, you know, if you kill the dummy 50 times, it doesn't really matter, does it? So it really is a great learning environment and something that's totally different than the classroom environment that I was in, like you are right now, where you're sitting down and somebody's up there talking and, and you're scribbling notes or trying to remember things. Um, so I think that's, a, that's one of the really unique things that's happened. And I think really uh, we're creating better clinicians now than we ever had the opportunity to do in the past because of the technology that's out there. So I don't think technology is something that you need to be tremendously scared of. What about healthcare challenges? Again, you know, all kinds of healthcare challenges are out there. And, and I can tell you that my dad, when he retired, he just kind of shook his head and he said, you know, son, I live through the golden age of medicine. I don't know what's going on these days, but better you than me, you know. And I understood that because he practiced during a time when, again, you know, he was uh, uh, trading uh, what he knew oftentimes in a barter system. Um, it was mostly a cash-based practice. Uh, insurance was more of a catastrophic uh, kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, notes were really kept on almost index cards. They were like little, little files. And I'll, I'll never forget uh, when I got into medical school, I was so excited. I'd applied at Kirksville. I'd applied at the Kansas City School because being a native Missourian, I thought I'm going to cover all my bases uh, uh, in Missouri. And then I kind of like Texas too, so I applied to the Texas School. And the first school I heard back from was, was Kirksville. I call him up. I go, Dad, I got my acceptance letter. I'm really excited. And he said, well, son, congratulations. Really proud of you. He says, and just remember, he goes, if everything goes kaflooey, you can always trade what you know for a chicken. There's not a lot of people could say that. And he wasn't kidding. He was dead serious, you know. He's like, accountant can't do that. Lawyer can't do that. He says, but people need what you know, and you will never be hungry. I think it's an interesting perspective, and, and while it is 
obviously a little bit of a rural philosophy, but I think it's interesting when you, when you look at that. So, so that, was, that was his congratulations. You got into medical school. Good luck to you. You can trade it for a chicken. Uh, rural healthcare, I think, is, is one of the challenges that we face. I, I think that most would agree that in, in, in urban environments, People have great access, they've got access to high technology, but in rural environments, people don't necessarily have great access to healthcare and not necessarily access to the highest technology. I think that's an area that's really changing, especially with telemedicine, again, all the electronic interfaces that we have. Uh, the idea is that you should be in Blacksburg or in any rural area be able to access the highest quality and best care. And I think that's a transition that we're starting to see right now. And again, it's really a lot being technologically driven. So again, I think that's an area where technology has helped us dramatically. Obviously, from the standpoint of the healthcare delivery system, uh, we've got some cost issues. And I think that ultimately, with, and we could spend hours on cost, but ultimately what we need is better healthcare less expensively. And what that really translates into is more primary care and more prevention. So we need early diagnosis and early intervention as opposed to diagnosing things at the end of life where people are very ill with complex conditions and we spend huge amounts of money trying to prolong life for not a lot of time. But because we can and because we've been a very wealthy country, we have done that. So we've got the best acute care delivery system in the world, probably the best episodic care delivery system in the world, but we got a ways to go with respect to primary care and prevention. So I think that the switch to the primary care medical home where we're managing patients early and we're trying to get early interventions done, early diagnostics done. So to diagnose, for example, an adenomatous polyp in the colon before it becomes a full-blown colon cancer. So that's a very simple outpatient procedure to take out a precancerous colon polyp, but it becomes a very complex problem when somebody's got metastatic colon cancer it, 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 the cost differential is unbelievable. So again, primary care medical home, early intervention, better access to primary care. And obviously, you know, patients have to take personal responsibility as well. Now I think that there are lots of rewards of practicing medicine. So this is one of those kind of things where uh, I'm sure that, you know, Artists feel the same way, and pianists feel the same way, and engineers feel the same way. And speaking of engineers, so, I told you the story about my grandfather that was the mechanical engineer of some repute. He'd gone back and forth uh, between Stockholm and, and New York City and, and he was a, you know, like a lot of engineers, kind of a gruff uh, guy. You know, I can remember him as a little kid and, and uh, so my dad told me a funny story uh, a few years back. In fact, probably about the time I got into medical school. So that was when, you know, father-son talk was, all right, son, what do you think you want to do when you grow up? Well, you know. A lot of boys really idolize their fathers and you know, talk about, well, you know, maybe I might want to be an engineer like you and, and uh, that'd be really an exciting thing. And, and my, my grandfather, who again, who was a, sort of a hardcore <laughs> your Swedish guy, you know, it's kind of like uh, the Swedes are pretty icy, to be honest with you. They're very stern and you know, Viking-like. And so he looked at my dad and said, well, son, you know, I'm not sure you're smart enough to be an engineer. I, I think probably you should be a doctor like your cousin. <laughs> My dad went, oh, really? <laughs> that's a real vote of confidence. <laughs> so, so, uh, so anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's just a, a little aside. But I think that taking care of your fellow man, there's no higher calling. Uh, I mean, I, it's, it's an exciting thing for me to be able to get up and go to work and be able to, to take care of patients. And it's exciting for me to be able to get up and go to work and to teach first year medical students and second year medical students, and third and fourth year medical students that are on rotation, and residents that come through, and fellows that come through. On an individual basis, when I was in private practice, I felt like I could influence individual lives and families, and again, that's a very rewarding thing. And that was one of that, you know, practice or careers going eight to 10 years. So, I'm, you know, it's hard for me to think about it, but I'm really kind of entering that final phase of my career. And so my hope is, is that I've had the opportunity to train a lot of fellows. I've had the opportunity to teach a lot of people that are now out practicing medicine. And I hope that 
I can instill in them the, the, the same excitement, the same drive, and the passion that I have uh, for caring for people. Because it really isn't about, oh, let's see, I, I delivered that baby, I got $1,000. That's, that's it really, it's, that's not what the equation is. The equation is, is that you're helping your fellow man. And, and that's a rewarding thing. And as my dad said, you know, you can always trade what you know for a chicken. So you're not going to make a bunch of money like the CEO of some big company, but you're always going to make a good living. You're, you're going to have the respect of, of friends. You're going to have the respect of family. And, uh, and you're going you're to be in a very exciting and rewarding time to practice medicine. And I can't think of a more exciting and rewarding time to practice medicine than what's happening right now and what's going to be going on for the future as we become not only better at doing things locally, but increasingly globally focused with respect to, it's not just what's going on here in Blacksburg, Virginia, but what's going on maybe in Africa, or what's going on maybe in the Caribbean, uh, what's going on in third world countries that are medically underserved, because maybe some of the same things that are gonna help us to do a better job here rurally are gonna help us to be able to enhance healthcare delivery in other areas of the world. So again, I think it's just, a, I can't think of a, a better place to be and a better profession to be practicing. As I mentioned, I've got to do lots of fun stuff. So here on the sidelines here, evaluating injuries, working with, this is Mike Goforth, our head athletic trainer. And, and again, that's been just a lot of fun. I've been to lots of bowl games, both when I was at University of Toledo, although when you're in the MAC conference, Back then we had one bowl game tie in and I think now they've got three. Uh, but when you're in a power five conference, uh, obviously you got a lot more bowl tie-ins. And so I've had the opportunity to, to practice uh, you know, with some just tremendous athletes. Many of them have gone on to practice professionally. I've been fortunate to have covered four uh, major international multi-sport games, a Pan Am games, a Goodwill games, and was fortunate to be selected to staff for two Olympic games. Uh, the 2006 games in Torino, Italy. and uh, the 2010 games in, in uh, Vancouver. And uh, so, uh, and, and this is from the 2006 games, so here I am with Joe Pack. And, and one of the things that I'll, I'll just tell you folks is that you, it's not a great idea to get your picture taken with like really good looking skiers, you know, because it, just, it just is a little bit of a problem, you know. <laughs> So it's, you're better off next to the coaches, you know. I'm not sure that the beret things worked for me, but you know, it's, uh, it was part of the deal, so I went ahead and just went with the flow. And actually, uh, it was really exciting for the 2006 games. Uh, you know, all the athletes can march in that parade, and, and I can't tell you what a feeling that was walking into that Olympic Stadium with our national anthem playing, knowing that millions of people are watching you worldwide. And I was one of only two physicians that were selected to march with the athletes. And so that was, that was a huge honor. Uh, I was the head team physician for the freestyle ski team. And uh, that was the head coach for the freestyle ski team. So it, it was just, I, I just can't tell, I get chills uh, thinking about it right now. Uh, on, and this is, again, you know, you're involved, with your, when you're at an Olympics, you're on call 24-7 for 30 days. And uh, it's a really, really exciting time. Uh, we won a bronze medal in the, in the moguls, uh, Toby Dawson. Uh, Toby's a great story. He's an immigrant, a Korean-American. And uh, he was uh, just a, a great guy, like uh, essentially all the athletes I've been able to deal with, but in particular the Olympic athletes are just, they're, they're really, as the saying goes, all that in a bag of chips. So just, uh, let me get so just some random thoughts for you. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I think that having your own self-integrity is really important. You know, integrity of you know, relationships with your patients, integrity of relationships with your family, integrity of relationship with your friends. So you really got to have a lot of self-integrity to be successful in life, but in particular to be successful in medicine. Service before self. After all, it's a service profession whether you're delivering a baby to get a side of beef or whether you're volunteering in rural Appalachia or whether I'm volunteering in Torino because that's a volunteer position. They didn't go, oh man, you made it. Here's a hundred thousand bucks. Thanks for coming. That's a volunteer position and it's an honor to be there taking care of the best athletes in the world uh, in uh, you know, some really neat places. So, so that's, that's a service activity. And then excellence in everything you do. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, coming from rural Missouri, in a 
graduating in a class of 83 people. You know, the first class I showed up for at University of Missouri was an, it was an introductory chemistry course, and I know you guys have had that experience. This is a big place. There were 600 people in that class. I walked in there, I was like, man, there's, this is like about, you know, a third of my hometowns in here, you know. It's a huge class. It was a scary thing for me to be in there. And I thought, man, I bet there's, there's got to be a lot of smart people in here. I don't know if I'm going to measure up. And um, so, you know, obviously my academic record uh, was a good one. And then when I got to medical school, that's when I really got scared, you know, because I, I walked that first day in class, and you know, there's people that have got PhDs, they got master's degrees, and they're from all over the place. And, and I thought to myself, man, I gotta be the dumbest dude in this room, you know? But I said one thing to myself, and, and uh, as my sister used to joke, uh, and when she talks about me, she say, you know, Gunner had three jobs by the time he was 12 years old, and I swear he kept them for his entire life. And so I said to myself, you know, there might be a lot of people in here smarter than I am, but there's nobody that's going to outwork me. I'm going to work harder than anybody. So I, I joke now and say I made a career out of saying yes. I would say yes and then figure out how to do it. Finally, I'm just going to close with this, and as I told you, the, you know, at the Olympics, it's a, you know, it's a 24-7 job, and so the the cafeteria is open all the time because you never know when athletes are going to be coming and going and, and, and staff, etc. So I was sitting at the table. It was, I don't know, it was about 2 or 3 in the morning and we just uh, finished uh, working with some athletes and transitioning some people in and out. And I'd, I'd had very little to eat that day and I thought, man, I'm going to go get something to eat. And I saw that uh, Coca-Cola machine, and this isn't really about Coca-Cola, <laughs> but that, that slogan was there advertising mark for that Olympic. So Coke was a big sponsor. said, if life was an Olympic event, would you win a medal? And really struck me as something that I hadn't really thought about before, but it kind of gets back to that excellence in all we do. So if you get up every day and you think to yourself, all right, I'm going to give it my best effort. And my goal is to get on the podium. You know, I want to win a gold, silver, or bronze. I want to be really good today. If you get up with that attitude on a daily basis, no matter what happens to you, you're going to be successful. So never go stupid on that, you know? Just remember that. Get up, give it your best effort. Now some days, you're not going to get to the podium. That's just, that's just the way it happens. But it can't be for lack of effort, okay? can't be for lack of effort. There may be some circumstances, something happens, and, and again, it doesn't become your best day that you ever had. But every day you should start with the thought that this is going to be the best day, and I'm going to give it 100% effort, and I'm going to try to get on the podium. Because in my life, I do want to win an Olympic medal. I want to be the best I can be. So that's how you go from the banks of the Mississippi in rural Missouri bouncing down a country road in a Willie's Jeep and, and, and get to where I am today. It's with hard work. And that's just the bottom line. Be the first one to turn the lights on and the last to turn them off. So thanks for your attention. I appreciate it.